Welcome to the creative community. I'm your host David Starkey and today we're going to be visiting with two artists working in the margins of their fields. First, Rafael Perea de la Cabada will introduce us to the work of an artist he calls Juan Pintagallos. And then William Davies King will introduce us to what he calls Ruin Books, the art of bibliolage. First though, we're going to talk to Rafael. Um, we're here in his studio and he's going to introduce us to this mystery guest that you've been talking to me about, Rafael, for the last month. Every time I see you, it's Juan Pintagallos this, Juan Pintagallos that. Who the heck is Juan Pintagallos? Well, he's, uh, <coughs> he's an artist that I met uh, years ago and I've been kind of uh, asking him to show and uh, has been a long road. And wh where'd you meet him? Uh, I met him in different places, but uh, I think uh, the, the uh, recollection that I have of the first meeting was in a small town in my uh, hometown, Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And uh, He was in a small town outside Mexico City? Outside Mexico okay. City, yeah, and I was uh, just going for a small trip and I, I saw some of his work and I've been fascinated by mm -hmm. what he's doing. Yeah. Well now, one of the things that you and I have been talking about is that your work is so different from his. I mean, you were born and raised in Mexico City. You were trained as an artist there. You were trained as an artist in the UCSB MFA program. And he's really somebody who's working without any kind of formal training. Yeah, I don't think he had any training. And uh, that's what I like about it. He still preserved this kind of innocence and this kind of just uh, visceral uh, love for paint and for drawing. Uh, but he's incredibly shy. It's very hard to um, to get him to talk to me about his work. Yeah. But and he's going to be with us today. so I, I hope so. I mean, I, I'm, I'm laughing because I've been saying, well, maybe I should be interviewing him. And I mean, my Spanish is really horrible and he only <laughs> speaks Spanish, right? Yeah. Um, and you didn't want to act as an interpreter. But um, it's, it's an interesting thing because, um, you know, it, it's very, I don't know, I can't remember a single time when I've interviewed someone else about another artist who could physically be present. And doesn't that strike you as odd? Mm, yeah, it's actually kind of weird. I have to <laughs> tell you. Yeah, but I think it's, it's, it's one way, it's one, uh, it's one compromise we, we agreed to actually do this uh, and be, I become a little bit of a kind of like an interpreter of what he's, right. he's yeah. because he's having a show finally. and uh, in Santa Barbara. Yeah, in Santa Barbara. So I would like to introduce his work and um, you were kind to talk about it. Well, you know, I, one thing, I, I, I know you're going to get mad at me for bringing this up, but um, I, I, I understand that you kind of maybe taken like a cut of, uh, of, of the work. Yeah. I know, I know that's, that's a dealer. That's, well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's general in the art world. I know that if you sell some at a gallery, you may have 50% that you give to the, to the gallery owner. But you're, you're his agent, so you're taking something in addition to the, the gallery cut. That's pretty much a standard 40, 50 percent. Yeah, that's like that. <laughs> that's like a which is odd, <laughs> but you know that's that's what galleries uh, charge for when I sell my work. Uh, but you know we have an agreement. I'm trying to promote his work, and I at the same time trying to um, develop uh, a history of, of his his process and his uh, biography to the community. So we'll talk about that process a little bit. Because people were looking over our shoulders, and and we'll we can drop these shots in later in, in after the interview is formally over. Um, he is literally a, a pintagallos. He's painting, <laughs> he's painting roosters. Um, yeah. And, you know, they're, they're different, but he's, he's clearly working almost, not, not exactly off of a formula, but a model maybe, would you say? Uh, I don't know if I, he would like to be you know, a formula necessarily, yeah, I know, but, but I, I understand what you mean. But I think he, he has a certain style, a way of, he has a a connection to that subject matter. Mm -hmm. He actually had roosters around growing up, and oh, he grew up in rural yeah, Mexico. Yeah, yeah, and for him, the rooster is a very important symbol. Uh, he used to wake up with them, and uh, it's almost like the, the, the day is not finished if he doesn't hear the end or the beginning of a rooster. So, and he's using in this case uh, feedbacks from from. Uh, uh, so he's painting on top of feedbacks. yeah, on top of feedbacks, and and, and, and the, the frame is made are, actually yeah. are made with beautiful wood, like a hundred years old right. uh, wood that is done by. A by a friend of his, right. um, um, Dan, 
uh, and they're beautifully made. So, well, talk to me a little bit about the tension between you're a very avant-garde artist. I've worked mm -hmm. with you, you know, over the years in various capacities, and and I know that that you're always pushing things. You, you don't want to settle for the first or the second or the third or the nineteenth thing that occurs <laughs> to you. You keep on pushing, whereas one seems to be in a kind of different artistic space. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I don't know where he is. I, as I mentioned, I, I don't know him that well. I just uh, being kind of respectful about his privacy. Right. So, is so, he living here in town? Uh, he doesn't want to tell me where. I, I last time I we met, we just met in the park. Right. Uh, and I saw some of his work in, a, in, a, in the back of a garage in a home, uh -huh. and uh, ended up purchasing a couple uh, uh, carving things that he was doing. Mm -hmm. But I don't really know him that well, but uh, I'm just trying to generate an income for him, mm -hmm. for him to continue his practice. So if viewers are watching this, he doesn't have a website or anything, obviously. <laughs> I would like to create, I, actually I've been talking about creating a website for him. Just for him, okay. Yeah, just for him. And but then it's, it's a very commercial endeavor, but, right. but uh, since it's not me, I, I, I right. don't mind doing yeah. it. Well, talk a little bit about that difference between commercialism and, and kind of artistic integrity because he, he is doing this work that that would hang well in a, in a lot of public spaces. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to again. I don't want to, to denigrate it in any way, but you could see it in a dentist office or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I know. Sorry, yeah. um, nothing against my dentist. Yeah. Um, but you know, what what is he all about in terms of, of his art? Is he yeah. is he is he trying to push beyond these retablos? Well. Just as a side note, uh, some of the collectors of my work are dentists. They are very, very good in, okay, in terms okay. of the, their um, their eye is very sharp. But um, I, I I don't know what to tell you. I think there's obviously a, a, a commercial element to the whole thing. But uh, the artists have to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with m making an income to right. be able to keep creating your work. I think what I'm feel a little bit apprehensive is uh, is I don't want this to be perceived as exploiting him or anything like that, you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, uh, but it's more it's more like, it's, it's more uh, a collaboration and a collaboration yeah. in a way. I think the moment but that he's he, doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just talking in front of the television. Yeah, yeah. He he works pretty hard. Yeah. He's doing a lot of uh, maybe later you can show yeah. doing a lot of kind of retablo like. Right. Uh, drawings uh, and um, with personal bottom, stories. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, should I grab one? Yeah, could you? But he just, he's making this. Uh, Show to the camera, maybe. Yeah. These pieces, and he, I, I really like his drawing. Like what he's doing, uh, it seemed to be very spontaneous, uh, and all the stories are a little bit uh, strange mm -hmm. to me. And uh, you, I imagine you will appreciate them because you're a writer. Yeah. Um, so he he, uh, you told him that he should potentially be here, right? I mean, did you tell him about the, I'm, I, I know we're on camera, but still, but is he? To be here, here in the yeah, interview? Yeah, here at this time. yeah, I told him I have a very, uh, you know, uh, good friend that uh, he's a little bit crazy. Sorry, yeah. I don't want to introduce <laughs> you. And uh, in a good way, right. and uh, he would love to talk to, love to talk to you about your work. And okay. he said, uh, took like maybe five times to bring in the theme again and again, uh -huh. and okay. the topic, and finally he agreed to do it. Okay. Well, we'll, 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 we'll keep on talking and hope that, that he, he shows up here uh, before we run out of time. Yeah, I don't take it personally. If he doesn't show up, <laughs> yeah. he has done it before. Yeah. So, so uh, tell me more about, I mean, what you know of his life. So he's, he's working on a farm, uh, living on a farm, he begins painting, just teaches himself? Well, the problem with the whole thing is that he keeps changing in the story. Okay. <laughs> okay. He tell me one thing, then he tells me another one. Right. And he was growing in rural Mexico, then he was actually living in the city. Mm -hmm. Then he said he was an orphan, then he said he has three three uh, brothers and sisters okay. and so so it keeps flipping around so, and, and it's really unstable to me. It's and why, why do you suspect why he's not telling you the whole truth? It, well, maybe he's, uh, he, he's trying to create some kind of myth or story. I don't mystery, know. Yeah. I don't even know if he's thinking about it that yeah. way. But, but it's happening. But it's happening. I think I'm very intrigued by it. And I think uh, I'm, I'm very curious about what else he's going to keep making. Right. So right right now, if, if somebody's watching the show and they would like to get a hold of his work, they have to go through you in yes, order to get it. And, and you, until you're, I create a website. And, and your website is uh, 
Perea, Rafael, Rafael Perea. Perea. Com. But the thing, I don't know if he's going to make more because he only make, I don't know, maybe like seven or nine and most mm -hmm. of them have been sold. Yeah. And there's some of the ones that have And pretty good prices, I understand. Yeah. Good. So well, congratulations <laughs> to both of you. <laughs> 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 yes. but, but, hold on. Yeah. Oh, is, is that him? Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, whoa, whoa, Juan. Whoa. Whoa. Oh. Okay. Oh, you know, sometimes he would likes to go in the back and just work in the, okay. in the back of the studio. So. Senor Pinto Gallos, um, Tengo una pregunta. I don't think he wants to interview okay. you right now. So, do you want to talk Actually, to him, or you just yeah, want to? Can, he I just works back him. there. Yeah, I can. I can ask him a few questions that you can ask me. Or no. Okay. Well, I know you kind of interpret for him. So, <laughs> so I yeah, mean, do, do you? Well, he works. He works uh, over there. Uh, with me in the back he works. There's a big open space yeah. back there. He does his thing there, and that's that's fine. Okay, so should we just leave him alone? He, he never said he was going to be interviewed, so he will be here. Okay, so he's so physically present on the other side of that wall, but he's not here yeah, with so us. So I don't know. If he, I don't want to. I want to. I want to push it either. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, okay. As much as we can, let's try and get back to the interview. I, again, I, it, it's odd to have him so close and yet and yet so far. I mean, what else would you want to say? Kind of in the defense of his work because you know again we're i'm thinking that some people might try and dismiss it but clearly i mean you have a financial incentive to help him out yeah. but you i don't think but you would do it just for that i think it's more than that i think um then put it this way i think we all have a juan pintagallos in our persona in okay. a certain way okay. i'm sure you have someone oh yeah like i've that. i've often that's why i protect that personas, yeah that's yeah. why i kind of protect his time and space because we all want to set aside a time to do our work without mm -hmm. being interrupted, without being um, concerned about the economics of mm -hmm. what we're doing or right. criticism about if it's good or not. Yeah. So in a way, I'm kind of sheltering him from that. Right. You know, <clears throat> I just choose what I think is good according yeah. to my eyes. Yeah. And I present it to people that could be interested in purchasing the work and then I, I right. pay him for his part and I right. get mine. So I think I tried to keep that very clear. So that's why this interview thing is kind of weird. It is. Well, and it, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of the, um, the Portuguese writer Fernando Pessoa who had these different personae that mm -hmm. wrote bo full books themselves. I mean, I, would, I was beginning to think that you were making him up <laughs> until he walked into the... Um, For a moment, I thought it was a figment of my imagination. <laughs> but uh, no, but, he's... So he's around. physically present he's a, a physical human being but but he also sort of seems to be this manifestation of your desire as you're just saying to kind of paint without having the pressure of, of maybe you know I mean it's something about behind us here where we see mm -hmm. well, that's that's more um, typical work as is you know the piece over there with a, a stick a, a mm -hmm. coming out of a guy's mouth and a bird on it versus yeah. versus a you know a rooster no, there's something that I've mentioned before that I really like about the spontaneity and the, the freedom when he works. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, just, just using a simple subject, which is just an animal, a, a rooster, and you know, expanding it into just the pleasure of the paint. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how much he thinks about the, the, the you know, the technique, or he's more kind of, he's very natural in the way he's mm -hmm. working. So I, I try not to disrupt that too much. Has he, has he affected your own work at all? Yeah, sometimes I think about it. I, sometimes I'm very curious about what he's doing, and I kind of I think I've been influenced by him. But I think my work uh, influences so? him. Uh, I kind of been influenced by his line, his drawing, mm -hmm. uh, by a little bit of this uh, protectiveness about his own creative outcome. Okay. And, um, and I think sometimes maybe I, I you influence him as well. I influence him as well because I, I think I spend a lot of time in the, the layering of the, the pieces and the, uh -huh. the thinking and the, the reasoning behind it. Sometimes he doesn't necessarily need a reason. He just do it. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's, uh, it's very connected to the way we right. talk as well. Sometimes we have something to say. Sometimes yeah. it's just because we want to talk. We right. just enjoy the person and we just converse. Right. So he's in that moment in which he's enjoying what he's doing until you come and bother him. <laughs> yeah. And now clearly yeah. his name, Juan, painter of roosters, is, is, a, is a pseudonym. Um, the, did you give him yeah. that or did I he just... I made that up because he didn't want to tell me his name. Do we, is his name even Juan, do we know? I, I know he's Juan because I, I saw him one time, uh, uh, was uh, actually having coffee with a friend. So I've been walking by and, uh, and a friend called him Juan. And then I, I saw him turn around right. they talked for a second. And I tried to contact um, this particular That's person right. to tell uh, me some yeah. story about well, him, yeah. and he, he didn't want to talk about it. So yeah. I don't know if it's a bad or good thing. Yeah, no, and again, I, it's starting to make me think, is this interview a, a good idea? We, if he's trying to 
to maintain some sort of secrecy, then maybe we should respect that. On the other hand, he did walk into the studio and he crossed yeah. both the cameras. No, he, he <laughs> writes a lot of stories in the retablo things. Uh -huh. and he, he does tell me a few things about his life. Uh, but as I mentioned, the next day we talk about it, he has something else. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly his story changes from all being the time. orphaned, he has uh, you know right. a parent, and then uh, and coming from different locations from Mexico. And I, so I kind of trying to figure out how much of that is just to keep me interested mm -hmm. uh, in, in in his work, right. or maybe just the way he he is. Yeah. You know, we all have all these different <laughs> <laughs> yeah, personalities. I, I guess <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, I guess I guess we c can kind of come to a close. I mean, um, um, you know. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Juan, uh, dice que muchas gracias. Okay, okay, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But I can tell him that you, you appreciate yeah. uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. there. And, uh, um, we can maybe have some coffee or something. I can see if we can. We can get him. Yeah. Maybe we, yeah, can, yeah. we can get a GoPro or something hiding on another table and we can yeah, get we, we can <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, thanks as always. No, thank you um, for and sorry about the, the whole. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you know. <laughs> As you say, muchas <laughs> gracias, and, uh, and um, thank you. And um, I guess we'll say um, thanks for to, to Rafael. And um, on that note, we will head on over to see William Davies King. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Here we are in the couch of your very comfortable living room. Um, we met you about six years ago when your book Collections of Nothing came out, and um, it's a book about, I'm not going to say your mania for collection, <laughs> but your, your um, predilection for, for holding on to things. A great book, and we, we managed to look at a lot of your um, collections, which are over there. Um, and and I, I remarked to you then how um, Tidy and you know your your houses, even though you've got this sense of always holding on to stuff. How, do, how does that happen? Well, indeed, collections of nothing was about how to take the tens of thousands of things I've accumulated as a collector over the years and essentially turn it into one thing. Right, a book. this book. Yeah. Uh, not that I gave up all the collected right. materials, but I uh, but I did kind of condense it into this object, uh, which was. Um, a real important development for me, um, and in fact, as I was writing this, I was um, uh, in my spare time when I couldn't write. I was doing another book, and that was also a kind of collecting, but it was a collecting of dictionary images, the wow. little pictures that show up in old dictionaries. And I was creating a kind of pseudo dictionary out of it by just uh, pasting them into this old lab book. Mm. And so, again, it was about taking a bunch of things, and I had uh, collected a whole lot of dictionaries, and cutting them up and condensing them and turning it into one object. Mm -hmm. And I found that I really liked that process a lot, and I've always liked books, and I've always collected books uh, for my own academic reasons as well as uh, just out of the enjoyment of books. But I started to look at books in a different way uh, and in terms of how maybe I could um, develop a kind of art out of this condensation. Um, and so uh, one of the early things I did was uh, to take um, that familiar book, The, uh, the Bible, and uh, I found this wonderful revised wow. New Testament, yeah. a beautiful old book, and decided to revise it even further. It was nicely illustrated. Um, and I decided that I would make a little intervention in each one of these pictures. So let's just let's slow down and describe what, what we're seeing here. So um, what's, give us a, a typical intervention here. This is, it's a little bit sacrilegious, I must say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, um, it, I'll take a look at it. So it says, the scourging of Christ, and we see this kind of typical scene that we, we know from the gospel. And then there's this Victorian gentleman with his hands behind his yeah. back sort of looking on. Um, what, what I thought of it as is 
uh, is, is where am I in relationship to this book? Mm -hmm. And so I kept uh, in looking for pictorial material to insert, finding things that expressed my sense of distance and, and connection to this mm -hmm. material. Yeah. Like, how do I connect to this? Um, and and what's, what's the answer to that question? Uh, comically uh, <laughs> and surrealistically <laughs> and yes, in a way that doesn't, yeah, yeah. in a way that can't be rationalized right. entirely. Um, and, but in a way I liked. Mm -hmm. um, and very quickly I became obsessed with this as anyone who's a dedicated collector is a bit of an obsessive. And uh, at this point now, six years later, I've created over 100 uh, books of this wow. sort. Wow. And so these are collages, but the collage begins with a book. So it's bibliolage, you call it, right? That's the new term that I coined for yeah. this. You begin with a book, a biblio, uh, and you collage into it. You, you uh, find images to uh, illuminate or hyper illuminate, mm -hmm. I say, uh, every one of the pictures in that book. Uh, and I found that uh, it's led to a whole new way of looking at books, a new way of collecting books, and uh, and it's a new kind of occupation for me to uh, to experiment with this sort. Of thing. You know, it's interesting to me that um, you call the books that you um, cannibalize mm -hmm. ruined books. Yeah, um, and I think that's interesting because um, the the book that results. It, it, that's the hyper illuminated book. That's mm -hmm. that, that's the what is it? The it's not the Ur book. It's the opposite of the Ur book. <laughs> um, but it's 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 the thing towards which all the other books are in service. Yeah. And then you just toss the other books out, right? More or less. Some, yeah. Sometimes if there's more material to extract from something, You'll they're like mines, you yeah. know. And there's yeah. there's ore there right. to pull out. Um, and but yeah, it's it's rebooking a book. Mm -hmm. um, and often what I look for is a book that has space in it, some capacity to hold something more. So uh, I love interior decoration books. This is a book about bathroom design. Yeah. Um, and so it's filled with images of bathrooms. Um, bathrooms of belief is and the... <laughs> I came up with the idea of like, what if it, I just put other imagery into these right. and occupy these bathrooms with uh, various pictorial elements and it suddenly becomes a very um, crowded house in a sort of a, 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 kind of a wonderfully populated world right, right. Uh, out of an empty house. Well, when, when I see something like that, I, I, that's one of my favorites, I have to say, Bathrooms of Belief. Um, I can't help but be reminded of Monty Python, for instance, in the way that yeah. you have a lot of Victorian imagery, these, um, these line drawings. Um, is, is that a, an influence at all? I mean, you mentioned comedy. Um, talk a little bit about the process of collage and, and, and what your influences are. One of the deep uh, traditions of collage is to take the, the sort of golden age of pictorial material, um, which is the 19th century, the moment when suddenly magazines and newspapers had those wonderful engraved illustrations, and to, uh, and to reuse those in a way that kind of awakens to the modern world. Mm -hmm. um, so Max Ernst, uh, the surrealist, right. is a really wonderful example of that. And, uh, and then the Monty Python is, uh, is a purely comical use of that, but wonderfully surrealistic. It suddenly just kind of introduces this interrupted world. Right. Uh, Joseph Cornell is another artist right. who's uh, r really wonderful at that. And I could not resist going down that pathway, at least initially. Mm -hmm. And so works like this Bible and uh, to some extent this um, have that kind of feeling. Uh, after a while, I got a little uh, feeling like, well, I should branch out. Yeah. I should look at other kinds of things. Um, so for instance, I might take, uh, this is a, a book of oh. Edward Hopper paintings. Okay. Um, and, you know, Hopper's paintings are so... Uh, present this condition of loneliness, this emptiness in the world, uh, this unpopulated world. And uh, I, I got another <laughs> <Enter> book. Dave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got another book of Edward Hopper, and I created, I call it Hopper Hopper. Uh, so I cut up the Hopper images and, and introduced them into the Hopper paintings. Right. And suddenly, 
they're not so That's lonely good. anymore. <laughs> they're kind of like a populated. Yeah. Here's here's that man sitting on the street, but there's a naked lady standing in front of him. <laughs> and here's that lonely gas station, right. but there's a, a woman in the... Well, there, there's okay. something really subversive about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's, it's clearly playful, but um, is nothing sacred for you? We've got the... Bible, we got the dictionary, we've got Edward Hopper for Pete's sake. I mean, um, you know, what what are you what are you up to here? I don't always <laughs> focus on religion, but this maybe is the height of that. This is a book that's called Tell Me About Jesus Snakes. And this book is a child's book, Tell Me About Jesus, that was given to me by my oh, grandparents, wow. and I have my name written into it. Yeah. Um, and so I've had this from the time I was a childhood. My grandparents were very religious and suddenly it occurred to me that the thing that it lacked was snakes sure, yeah. and so I I populated this book with <laughs> snakes and they would just roll over in their yeah. grave to see this uh, sort of thing but yeah. so, I, so sometimes there is definitely that subversive well that is that is which, that you looking back on your tradition your family tradition and saying hey I'm no longer a part of that well if that's quite true. I came from the Bible Belt, and here I am in California, and California has become this state of displacement, mm -hmm. this state of, I'm not there anymore, and so I'm free to do whatever I want to do, and I can uh, hang a surfboard on my ceiling, and mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. Um, and I, I like that uh, declaration of freedom, and um, and sometimes it taps into an angry side where there's a, like for instance, I come from a Germ, German uh, family background, at least in part. And uh, so in one of my book search ex, ex, excursions, I found this beautiful old edition of Faust, Goethe's Faust, um, deluxe printed mm, yeah. edition, gorgeous. And I thought to myself for uh, over a year, what, what would I want to bring into this? And... Um, and then I came across a, a book of Hummel um, figurines, <laughs> and I thought, Hummel Faust, of course, yeah. that, that's the solution to it. And I started to work on that, and then I felt, well, that's not quite enough. Right. Uh, and so then I found a book um, called um, uh, Swastikas at War, which was taking us right to that Second World War. Right. And so now it's Hummel Faust at War. Right. And... Um, so each page, each image here has um, has something from that Nazi era right. set of images and a homo figurine and something of the, the Faust so imagery. Faust. So it's, a, it's sort of like a recipe or a little formula that I work yeah. out. And then once I've worked it out, then I'm locked into it f until I finish the book. And so sometimes... How long I, does that take? Well, it can take up to two or three months sometimes uh -huh. uh, if I've got a heavily pictorial book. Right. And so sometimes I find myself kind of condemned to a project that I have to carry out to the last bit. Um, actually, that Bible book, the f early one, that took uh, almost a year because e every time I turn the page, there's another image. Uh, and it's sort of like they there's this... You, you can't rip them out or anything. Or you don't. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> but this kind of indulgence in right. picture yeah. that was part of that religious uh, moment uh, is something that then places yeah. me under this sort of obligation. Well, so, you, yeah. you know, it's interesting because I, I'm thinking that um, you're talking about California as a place of displacement and yeah. rebellion. And yet the urge to collect is, is certainly an urge to recapture the past, to hold on to it, um, mm -hmm. not to let things go. So those, mm -hmm. those things are at war. Even, even in Hummel Faust at war, yeah. um, you're, you're bringing back some German heritage, certainly not necessarily <laughs> the brightest moments, but um, uh, at least in the at war bit. Um, uh, how is that all? Working? Well, like any, I think like any artist, the material you choose to work with uh, you're going to you're going to be dealing with that for a prolonged period of time, and as you do that, you're processing it through your memory and your uh, emotional connection to that material, and so there is a, a way in which just doing this kind of art uh, gives me an opportunity to kind of think through mm -hmm. who I a am as you're working. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so there's a there's a way in which it locates me as well. Um, 
and you know we're all dislocated and we're all uh, kind of searching for um, you know our our home and uh, and in a way I think I keep searching I, in different ways kind of different angles on that question um, I'm interested in the medium because you talked about when once you get working and that was a you know life uh, book here yeah um, and you mentioned, I like to create these boxes. Yeah, oh, the, the boxes are fantastic. But you're talking about, and that's what I was getting at, was Joseph Cornell's boxes. Now, yeah. those are, he's doing a lot of the same things you're doing, you know, in a scene or two. You're doing it scene after scene after scene. Mm -hmm. But the advantage, obviously, of a box is that there it is. It's on a museum wall. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a lot of money for it. It's a work of art. And, and I know from talking to, to Mary Hebner, another book artist in, in town, that it can be really difficult to display books, although I know she also says there's always a way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, right now, you have all this fabulous stuff, and from what I understand, you haven't sold anything. You've, you've given a few copies away. Yeah. Tell me about these things as products, because when I was looking at your website, which is a, a fascinating website, um, I kept thinking, well, yeah, you know, how much are they? Um, mm -hmm. And and they're not for sale. Well, I haven't I haven't really even faced that question of is this something I'm creating as a commercial product? Um, it just hasn't really been something I could address or am prepared to even think through. The website has been the best way I can find to share this material. Uh, it is created though as a book and a book gives you a certain tactile relationship to an object and you need to have it on your lap and you need to be able to turn the pages at your own pace and you need to involve yourself in it and maybe you do want to stop in a page and read the content mm -hmm. of that page uh, so I, I, I would love it if that was possible but these are unique items they are indeed yeah there's, I don't know, I, I think they would lose something to republish them and mm -hmm. I guess take photographic images and, and make uh, numerous 10, copies. 10,000 copies, them. yeah, of Hummel Faust. I just don't think there's that's a lot of copyright thing. issues involved, too, <laughs> clearly. That's another thing I haven't even faced yeah. um, uh, the appropriation of other content. Yeah. But, uh, but having somebody leaf through these books, having a whole bunch of people do that, of course just subjects them to lots of wear and tear. And I have had a couple of exhibits and have just said, well, let's just see what happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far it hasn't been and, and, seen and, any damage. And the viewers can come and touch the books? And yeah. Open? Uh -huh. yeah. So That's uh, pretty brave. <laughs> so here's, a, here's one that came out of such a throwaway piece. This is a, a, a catalog that came from Illy Tahari, some... Um, I guess it came from Saks Fifth Avenue. And uh, so this is the kind of thing that normally you'd throw away. Right. Um, but I had this book called Tombs, Graves, and Mummies. And I somehow just thought that would be a good thing to, to combine here. So each image here is of a beautiful fashion model uh, showing off some garment. And then and combined with these images dead. of corpses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Skeletons. So there's memento like mori right there for you, and um, it, it's. I mean, th I think th what I'm really struck by is is how careful you are in in arranging things. That that's what I've been thinking over the last few years. Is what what is art? Well, art is just simply the knack for arranging things, whatever it's words or notes or pictures. Is that something that you're kind of preoccupied with? Is where this goes in relation to? That's the most fun part of it. Yeah. Um, and so I will, I will buy a book, usually at the library sale or at the Planned Parenthood book sale. So I like to find books that are more or less thrown away anyway, um, or that, that you would throw away. Right. And then I sit with it for a while and think, well, what, what intervention would be ideal here? And I look around. <laughs> intervention. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I wait months yeah. to find the appropriate uh -huh. material to go in there. Uh, and then... There's that whole thing of uh, you, you cut an image out of your source, of, of one source book, and then you look through this and you find the, mm -hmm. the, and it's almost like destiny sometimes where you have an image and you leaf through the book and then you find, ah, this is the Just place so, for yeah. it. Uh -huh. And then, yes, it does take 
time and care to figure out exactly how to place it down there. And given that it's all done with glue. Yeah, well, in, in fact, I have your um, toolbox. So for viewers who have been expecting to see, you know, this elaborate set of, of tools, uh, let me take out some of the things. So we have glue, Elmer's glue. <laughs> Not recommended by archival people, okay. by the way. Uh, we have a ruler. That was 17 cents All at right. uh, the store. Um, an exacto knife, and I can certainly see where the, some pieces are, yeah. are pretty close. But but you're telling me that this orange pair of scissors is really where it happens. <laughs> Somehow that is the best. And I have, uh, over the years, tried to get you know very nice scissors, and I found that nothing works better than those cheap uh, you know, hardware store yeah, yeah. scissors. Um, and the X-Acto knife I only use to cut out the sort of inside material. I okay. love the process of just using the scissors okay. and uh, going along the edge of something. Um, so that that's really part of the joy of, of the whole thing. Now, where are you doing this? We're, we're here in your living room. I know right you have here. a study. You're right, you're right, here. right here. What's going on around it? Is your wife, Wendy, in this space? or uh, what? I typically do this in the evening. My days, my days are generally taken up with my You're a professor job at UCSB. At, right. right. And so uh, at the end of the day, I feel exhausted. We put on a Netflix movie, and uh, I bring out my little box. Uh, I look behind here. I've got a storehouse of material that I've accumulated, right. uh, those books will not be read. Those books will be cut <laughs> up. Be uh, <laughs> they will be ruined. And uh, so I, I pull out my project and uh, with my little box, I get the scissors out and I, um, I have this special pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. My uh, grandfather, a doctor, an eye doctor, uh, his, uh, one of his little collections was uh, people's spectacles uh -huh. so people would uh, leave these behind and uh, so I like to wear this oh yeah pair. that's a good look for you and these are <laughs> these are very old um, but they give me a very good close look at things yeah and uh, so I cut for a couple of hours a night and, and so you're kind of watching the movie and, and yeah. kind of paying attention so that's an interesting it's it doesn't require absolute silence and, and solitude oh, for no. you to do this no in fact I I like that there's a, a sort of a life going on mm -hmm. in the background, and uh, we tend not to watch foreign movies, though, because you, the you subtitles you'd have to look up too much. So. <laughs> so, you know, you finish a book, and then do you ever think, okay, I'm done with this now, or, or you immediately have, you've already got 10 other projects in mind? There's a panicky moment when I finish. Uh, which is about, well, how can I find the next thing that will be as interesting and will I find the next thing as interesting? And so sometimes I feel like I've exhausted all the different sorts of imagery. I've done over a hundred of these now. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but, but then very quickly I find something else that, that kind of occupies me and takes me in a new direction. Well, let's, we, we've got some more time. I'd love to, to, to have our viewers see more of what you've been up to. So um, uh, let's, let's take a look at some of your favorites. Um, this one I did some time ago, and this has more to do with sort of the written content of the book than okay. it does with the, um, the imagery in it. Uh, so David Foster Wallace, the you know, great mm -hmm. uh, postmodern novelist, um, he gave a really wonderful graduation speech at, I think, Kenyon College uh -huh. uh, called This is Water. And uh, I think it was after his death, this book was put together. And it, um, it's just that one graduation right. speech. And what the uh, editors decided to do was put one sentence on each page. And so the book ended up having a lot of empty space in it. Oh, wow. Perfect for you. And <laughs> so I uh, came up with this idea of putting these uh, yoga images uh -huh. and Pilates uh, these bodies in motion, these bodies uh, seeking relaxation through activity, right. um, or or dealing with stress in a in a creative way, I guess you might say. Um, you know, so I'm I put looking, those in here. As I'm looking over your shoulder here, and and I'm thinking that this is the sort of book that would 
reprint well. That I mean, whether you could get all the, the permissions from the, the yoga, but but it, it, it it's it's an interesting. It, it I don't know. Maybe maybe that's uh, maybe there's something wrong about that. But some sometimes something like that seems like it, it might be a, a joy to a lot of different people to to have. Maybe. But at this point, I just this fits it. neatly into yeah. this little book, and I uh, created this box out of a, one of the yoga books right. and. Uh, and that's and it? It's it now tidy, okay. and it All just right. does that work, uh, and I don't ask it to do anything more. I love creating these boxes, though. And uh, Yeah, talk so. about that process. Now, you see, a lot of them look like they're slipcases for art books, right? Yes, uh, or sometimes I make something that is a slip, like a slipcase, and I, I bought a whole roll of this library cloth to uh -huh. cover these things. So this is just an old cigar box, mm -hmm. but it's for a book that's called Dolly's Mustache, um, but I call it uh, Dolly's must ache. Um, and <laughs> so this is a, just... But Dolly a, <laughs> seems like a, he would be very much on board with this project, don't you think? Dolly has definitely been somebody that I've um, had to process my... In fact, at one point I got this beautiful book of Dolly, a book that Dolly himself put together. Um, and I thought, now what can I put in this? Right. Uh, and this is sort of like taking that surrealist master of juxtaposition and how can I be in his company? And finally it occurred to me the only thing I could put in there was more Dolly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I bought two other copies of the same book and I created a book called Dolly Dolly. Uh, <laughs> or sometimes they call it Dolly Dolly Dolly. Um, so this was the original wow. book. And, it's and that's beautiful. A, quite a grand looking book there. And so here's that uh, sort of melted image, and I just cut another image in there. Um, and actually, I, I enjoyed doing this, but it was uh, not entirely a success because it just looks like Dolly. Yeah, I mean, it, the game <laughs> <laughs> you have to open a page and you kind of feel where I've glued anything right, in, right. but he could have glued it in there as well. So <laughs> it, uh, it's just a more crowded Dolly uh, book. Um, yeah. It was it was an interesting one to do, but it, it it taught me a lesson that I need to find an otherness to address right. and not the same. And, and again, religions. I see this this um, I don't, we've uh, this is one you want to take a look at, but that's something that um, and, I'll, a, and I'll let you show it to the to the camera as well too if you want to. This is a recent one. Um, so this is called Big Farmer, Big Jesus. And so I, I came across this wonderful old children's book called Big Farmer Big. And it's a big book right. uh, to illustrate that. And then in the original publication, there was a little pamphlet that was glued on the front that was called Little Farmer Little. And these are two stories. One is about a very big farmer and the other is about a very little farmer. Um, the Little Farmer book was lost by the time I found this. Okay. Um, but I thought, what can I put in there? And I came up with Big Farmer, Big Jesus. And should, yeah, show viewers. So that. that's, a, so that's uh, Raphael, am I correct? It was a, a book, uh, it was a Reader's Digest published book of the art of Jesus. Oh, okay. So it was a whole compilation right. of different, different uh, images of Jesus's life. And, and somehow the combination of this larger than life farmer figure and and this larger than life human who was a god uh he kind of made a nice co nice uh -huh. combination and my eldest daughter is a farmer at this point and unexpectedly became a farmer and has uh, she seen farmer jesus she's seen it what does yes. she think she she likes this book so <laughs> <laughs> um so that was a fun one to do and then and then to this was such a delicate book that I had to create a nice box for it. So I um, ha have you shown these books to anyone who's really religious? Hmm. I mean, now you have. <laughs> You've just shown them to uh, anybody in Santa Barbara. <laughs> uh, I I don't think I have really had right. that encounter of yeah. somebody who's really religious okay. and. And maybe I've a little bit emphasized just by the right, randomness right, of my right. bringing out here. I, I'm not always fixated on that. Uh, there is a, a vein of books that uh, has more kind of erotic material. I, that's always... Right. Well, the, do we have the Vixen? Uh, is that is that around or is that I, a little bit too I erotic? Yeah. <laughs> some, of the, some, some of the works, like um, I can tell our viewers, there's one called The Mother Goose Book of Sex, right? 
Um, yeah, uh, we yeah. can't show that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes there are, uh, and of course, just anything that provides a rich vein of, of pictorial material is in my view site. Um, in this case, I, I got a book that was called In Response to Place, and here they had 10 artists, 10 photographers, ah. photogra uh, photographing places from the Nature Conservancy. Okay. Um, and so wonderful places. And so there are 10 different little portfolios in here. And I thought, well, I need 10 different interventions right. here. Um, so the cover here is very crowded because it, it, it shows them all. Oh, so for instance here, um, uh, Norman Rockwell is, is brought into this area, which is the Colorado Plateau wow. of Utah. But then in another section, uh, these are images from a book about madmen. Uh, these are, oh, what's the name of that cartoonist, New Yorker cartoonist? Um, so each section kind of suggested a different, this is a, a sort of a how-to book on tennis, which has really bizarre <laughs> pictures of <laughs> tennis players holding two rackets right, right, and things right. like that. Um, well, so I, I want to, like while we're looking at that, you've, yeah. you've mentioned the word intervention several times. And for me, I associate that word with someone who is addicted to a substance. Um, they are not listening to anything at all that everyone is telling them. So we have to have an intervention. We're going to go in, <laughs> we're going to get them, we're going to take them to rehab, and we're going to shape them up and we're going to get them back to normal. Now, for you, it's just the opposite. <laughs> it's something's normal and you're, it needs an intervention to make it strange. I think of it more in terms of like global politics, that there's a troubled situation in the world and... The so United States has to intervene what, to take care of it. Yeah, what okay. solution do you bring to that? Do you send, uh, you know, medical supplies? Do you send food? Do you right. send weapons? You know, those are interventions. And well, so I think of it as t finding a wounded place, a wounded situation, uh -huh. and then figuring out what like medical intervention right, right. Is, is about hear, that. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking to, in this particular book, in response to place, last great places, um, this is a beautiful picture of, of you know, the, the stone deserts of Utah. Why does that need an intervention? Why does that need Norman Rockwell to be hiding behind, <laughs> behind an arch? I don't think it's so much, it, I mean, it isn't an assault on the landscape. I love the landscape, but... Um, but I, I think maybe it's a, an assault on the kind of the sense that art can just uh, tap into the beauty of the world and and have it have beauty as a result mm -hmm. of that. And there's something a little um, arrogant about that that just says, you know, my camera, uh, you know, I have produced this beautiful right, picture right. by bringing you beautiful the Colorado right. Plateau, um, and. Um, that's not enough. So mm -hmm. it feels to me like, well, there are a lot of other people who could be right. out there too, including, uh, you know, golfers. And, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, William Wegman is another figure right. that I That's really like a lot. Uh, and he's, he's a creator of these surrealistic images. And talk about somebody who's uh, commerce-minded. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he's, he's wonderful at, at the production of uh, Christmas books and things like that. And so I, I did one of his, I don't have it right here with me, but uh, Red Army uniforms of World War II uh, combined with w William Wegmund uh, photographs. Um, oh, they stocks, yeah. So they, these are uh, models right now in full color uh, photographs of them wearing authentic World War II uniforms from the Soviet Union. And to bring that together with William Wegman, I, I, I just you I love that. You couldn't resist. Yeah. Here's the, the, the whole Soviet thing is, is generally interesting. This is Norman Rockwell, The Faith of America. Uh, and here I, I just brought in um, imagery from the history of the Soviet Union. And 
So it felt to me like Norman Rockwell as this feel-good artist of that era when the Cold War is building up, when indeed the world is in this extreme distressed state. Mm -hmm. But there's this kind of contentment at home because you can get the Saturday Evening Post and there's Norman Rockwell right. selling you this image that everything is benign and, 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 and happy. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in fact, revolution and pogrom and uh, gulag is happening all over the world at that at that same moment. So, I mean, uh, th these juxtapositions yeah. like this are clearly political in, in nature, yeah. Yeah, I guess this, in, in a way, probably everything is political. And um, so any of these books could be seen as a political sure. act. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a little more explicit, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, as we as we wind up our, our visit, I mean, talk to me a little bit about the future of, of this work. Um, I mean, I would like to see you make a buck <laughs> of it, Dave. But um, I, I also, you know, I admire the fact that you're you're making these for yourself. You're showing them to us, but you know, it, it's 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 also it's, it's your collection. Uh -huh. it's, it's 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 like the th things over there on the shelf. Well, maybe there will be some destiny for them in uh, in in some other collection. Uh, my children will maybe find a way to uh, bring them to the world or or keep them for the themselves. Maybe they'll fall apart because I use Elmer's glue. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <That's>, regret that. <laughs> the only commercial. A uh, possibility that has strongly suggested itself to me is if there's somebody out there who has a beautiful book that feels empty in a certain way, that that needs attention, I would be very much be in the spirit that. to ha being commissioned. And so what I would expect is you give me a book and let me think about it for uh, a few weeks and and probably I would be able to come up with some way of intervening in that book. And um, oh, so that, that could be like done on commission. Out. Okay, and the commission would be negotiable. They haven't worked that out yet, <laughs> yes, Still, I suppose yeah, it could yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think that would be a nice way to sort of allow people to kind of interact with what you've been doing. It's great to see you. I mean, every six years I see you, Dave, and, and you've come up with something entirely new. I can't wait for <laughs> six years from now. Well, Who knows what it will be? It's wonderful, and, and you're very welcome, and I'm very happy to have you here. Well, thank you so always. much. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Well, that's all for today. The Creative Community is produced with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. It's produced by JP Montalvo and TVSB. I'm your host, David Starkey. Thanks for watching. <laughs>